Hi, and welcome back to Psychology. Here is your Chapter 8 video. We are jumping right in, and this is on thinking. Here are your learning targets for today in Section 1. It looks like a lot, but it's not. It's only about um, eh, the usual amount of information you get, maybe a little more. But thinking, understanding thinking, what are some basic elements related to it? And then we'll talk about the three different kinds of thinking. Uh, in problem solving, section two, we'll discuss the two basic approaches to problem solving, and we'll talk about certain methods of problem solving and some obstacles to problem solving. And in section three, we're going to discuss deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, and some heuristics that we use in um, solving problems. So let's come up with our textbook definition of thinking. You all know what thinking is, but it is the mental activity that is involved in the three things, understanding, processing, and communicating of information. And there are different characteristics of thinking. A symbol is an object or an act that stands for something else. So if I said the word horse, horse, you think of a horse, that is a symbol. Um, the word horse and the letters in the word horse are symbols for the word horse. And symbols help us think about things that are not present. So obviously there's no horses around uh, right now unless you are, no, never mind. Uh, a concept is a mental structure that we use to categorize objects and into things that share similar characteristics. So we might have horses, they're all horses. We might have brown horses, black horses, uh, tan horses. So we will organize those concepts into hierarchies. And people learn concepts through experiences. We assimilate things into these hierarchies and schemas. And a prototype is the best example of um, the characteristics of a concept. So. The best example of a horse would be a Mustang, in my opinion. It helps us categorize the world and process the information in it. The three types of thinking. Convergent is the non-creative type. It's limited to facts. And so we take all the facts we have at the time and use it to find one solution to a problem or task. And um, y developing rules and using them is an example of convergent thinking. Divergent thinking, however, allows the mind to associate more freely and maybe come up with multiple solutions to a problem. This is how creative thinkers think. And you may go th through these and use one for one task and another for another. But you will get multiple solutions with uh, divergent thinking. And then metacognition is thinking about thinking. It's planning, evaluating, and monitoring, self-monitoring your mental activities. And it's thinking about thinking. Problem solving techniques. What do we use? We use algorithms and her heuristics. You've been in math your whole life now. You know what an algorithm is. It's the procedure that when used properly and in the right circumstances will always lead to the solution of a problem. Heuristics, however, are more like rules of thumb. And because algorithms are not always practical, or there may not be an algorithm for a certain situation. So they're shortcuts that are faster than algorithms, and they're not always reliable. And we'll get to some examples of heuristics here in a little bit. Here are some problems for you to try to solve. Uh, go ahead and push pause and read through these and see if you can. And then if you are stumped, uh, please look in your book at how to do it. But these are five basic problems that psychologists give uh, people to solve to see if they can. They will use some of these problem solving methods, such as trial and error, self-explanatory. Difference reduction is where we identify our goal and where we are in relation to it and the direction we must move closer to it. So I'm a junior in high school and I want to go to college. Um, so I would need to take the SAT, I would need to do college visits. That's a great example of difference reduction. What do you need to do to get to college uh, since it's a goal of yours, maybe. And means and analysis is, um, it's focusing on the means of something and having a certain end. So a particular action will have a particular result. 
And sometimes the ends justify the means, and that's where that phrase com uh, comes from. Working backward involves breaking a problem down into parts and dealing with each part individually. So people who reverse engineer things, they know when the they have the goal, they have the final product, but they may not know how to achieve it. So they break it down and they uh, learn how it was engineered or made. And then there's an analogy, which is a similarity between two or more things. And if you've solved a similar problem in the past using one method, you're liable to try that with the same method if it's similar enough to the first problem. Some obstacles to problem solving are mental sets. And this is kind of that uh, thing we just talked about. It's the tendency to respond to a new problem with an approach that was successfully used in the past. And that's not always a bad thing. That's your brain trying to be efficient or else you would have to use the same, uh, you would have to start every problem all over again. But mental sets um, are efficient but they do get in the way of problem solving and functional fixedness is an example of a mental set because it's the tendency to think of an object as being useful only for the function that the object is usually used for. In the problem with the strings and the scissors, you only see the scissors as being able to cut something, but it also can be used as a pendulum to swing the rope to one side of the room and then back to you while you are holding the other string. And so scissors can be used as a weight on a pendulum in order to do that. Let's get into reasoning. Reasoning is how we use information to reach conclusions. And there's two types. There's deductive and inductive. Deductive reasoning is going from uh, broad to general, so broad to general, upside down triangle. Um, in deductive reasoning, the conclusion is true if the premises are true. And a premise is an idea that provides the basic information and allows us to draw conclusions. For example, all men are mortal. That is true. Joe is a man. That is true. Therefore, our conclusion, Joe is mortal. The conclusion is deduced or deducted from the premises. Some more examples. Bachelors are unmarried men. Steve's unmarried. Therefore, Steve is a bachelor. All stringed instruments make sound. My guitar has strings. Therefore, my guitar makes sound. There are some invalid um, reasoning. If the premises are not true, then the conclusion is invalid. For example, all birds can fly. That is true. That it, I'm sorry, that is not true. All birds can fly, that is not true. A penguin is a bird, that is true. Therefore, penguins can fly is not true because one of the premises isn't true. Um, all humans are mammals. My cat is a mammal, therefore my cat is a human. Obviously not true. All humans may be mammals, but not all mammals are human. And I love the cartoon, penguins are black and white, old TV shows are black and white, therefore some penguins are old TV shows, and penguins are not very good at logic. Inductive reasoning is when we start out with a general statement or principle and reason down to specifics. In inductive reasoning, we reason from individual cases or particular facts to reach a general conclusion. So. The conclusion is sometimes wrong even when the premises are correct. It is highly likely to be correct, but we cannot be certain. So I'll give you some examples here, but we are inducing. We're not really sure of the answer, but we can be pretty sure if all the premises are correct. Most sciences, including psychology, rely on inductive reasoning. So let's take a look at some examples. Most students at a community college live within a 20 mile radius of the campus. Ivy Tech is a community college. Abby is a student at Ivy Tech, so more than likely she must live within a 20 mile radius of ID Ivy Tech. We can, we're not positive that's true, but it is highly likely. And then there's the old one, windows are broken, there's muddy footprints on the floor, jewels and electronics are missing, intruders must have broken into the house. We can be very sure, very, it's very probable that uh, burglars broke into the house, but not possible. 
or it's not always true. It's not definitively true. And I'm sure you could come up with a story as to what happened. Raccoons or whatever. Now, lastly, some de uh, decision-making shortcuts. And it, we use these, and they sometimes give us a false impression of what's going on. So the availability heuristic helps people make decisions on the basis of the available information in our immediate consciousness. So um, some examples. You see news reports about people losing their jobs, and you might start to believe that you are in danger of losing your job. So you start lying awake in bed each night worrying that you are about to be fired. But you're not taking into account that that is a lot of people, and you're only one person in a lot of people, and um, you're not worried about it. After seeing several television programs on shark attacks, you start to think that these incidences are relatively common. And when you go on vacation, you refuse to go swim because you believe the probability of a shark attack is high, but that's only the one, uh, that's only the, you only hear about shark attacks. You don't hear about the people who go into the ocean and swim fine. And it's the same thing with plane crashes. If you're afraid to fly because the plane might crash, well, you only hear news reports about the plane crashes. You don't hear about all the flights that make it safely to where they're going. And then there's the one about the lottery you can read. Representativeness heuristic. Um, people make decisions according to a sample that is according to the population that the sample appears to uh, represent. Represent. So if I meet someone with a laid-back attitude and long hair, I might assume they're from California. Or it's someone who is very polite but rigid, maybe English or from Britain. And people will assume that a random sequence in a lottery is more likely than an arithmetic uh, sequence of numbers, but that's not always true. Each one is the same um, probability. If I meet p three people from a company that are all aggressive, I'll assume that the company has an aggressive culture. Um, but that's not necessarily true. It's just the three people from that company are aggressive. Everyone else there may be very nice. And then finally, the anchoring.